Okay, so thank you, Pam. And for those of you who heard my talk yesterday, I promise you there are no neural network models and no eigenvalues or anything in this. Uh, somebody asked me if there was going to be data, and I said, no, not at all. And somebody said, is there going to be slides? Are you just going to talk? I said, yeah, there will be slides. Um, so, of course, my neuroscience colleagues, and then look out, and most of you appear to be neuroscience colleagues, always want to know what in the world you're doing talking about a topic like this, and how did you get into it? And, uh, you know, the, the answer is basically that we've been, as Pam said, studying neural mechanisms of decision making for quite a while. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it at all, we basically train monkeys, this is supposed to be a monkey, to look at TV screens, at little random dot patterns, and uh, tell us in any given random dot pattern whether they see rightward motion or whether they see leftward motion. In this case, most of the dots will be sort of twinkling around in random directions. But you can see there are a few here with the arrows on them. Uh, there's no real arrows on the screen, but these few with arrows are actually moving to the right. And the monkey can actually detect these very weak motion signals and realize that there's rightward movement. And if he does so, he indicates that by moving his eyes uh, rightward to this particular target. And if that's a correct answer, he gets a reward. And that's the only thing the monkey is working for is rewards. He doesn't care about science, but if he gets his reward, he's happy. If he chooses the wrong direction, he does not get a reward. And I can show you a little movie here of uh, one of these stimuli, just for those of you who've never seen it. And I'm going to show you a very easy one. The monkeys are extremely good at this, but you know, so, you, the, so that you feel good about yourself. I'm going to show you a very easy one, and your job is just to tell me the direction of motion you see there. And I think almost everyone can see that that's right. rightward motion. Good. Okay. So you would get, you know, a drop of cognac in response for that, <laughs> you know, if, if, you, if we were doing this seriously. Now, it turns out that there's, uh, when we started studying this, Mike Shadlin and I, you know, nearly 20 years ago now, um, no one had looked for neural correlates of decisions in the brain at the time. And we were kind of inspired to do this. Uh, Vernon Mountcastle had kind of anticipated it in some of his writings. Uh, but the real formal framework was laid down by these two guys, uh, Alan Turing and Abraham Bald, back in the 1940s as part of the Enigma code breaking project, actually. And they undertook this thing called sequential analysis that basically says, uh, when you're faced with a noisy stream of data like this, what you do is sample it one time interval at a time, and you look for evidence at each time interval uh, towards some particular conclusion about what the stimulus is. And they imagine that there are actually two accumulators, if it's a two alternative force choice sort of situation, and there's one accumulator that's accumulating this noisy, noisy evidence in favor of rightward motion. Now, they weren't working on motion. They were working on German wartime codes, but I'm just adapting it for you to a sensory situation. And another, evidence, another accumulator that accumulates evidence toward a leftward target. So your sensory stimulus is coming in like those random dots. And what you're literally doing here is just a temporal integration. And because the random dots are noisy, remember there are all those noises in them, it's not a direct line accumulating in favor of right, but it's a noisy sort of accumulation. And since most of that motion was right, it's rather a quick accumulation, and it hits some bound. And when you hit a bound, which is your degree of certainty that you want, uh, then you choose right. And of course, your leftward accumulator and that little stimulus I showed you is noisily drifting downward because there is, there was very little leftward motion in that particular stimulus. Uh, so because there's noise also, sometimes you'll get these correct and sometimes you'll get them wrong. And that depends, of course, on how strong the motion signal is. So this kind of inspired Mike and I to go in and see if we could, you know, this is a putative decision variable, putative decision process playing out in time. And we went in and looked uh, and did, you know, a, a lot of work over the years, and especially Mike has done particularly brilliant work on this over the years. And we've implicated a network of areas as being potential sites of this accumulation. Uh, the lateral intraparietal area here in the parietal lobe is one major focus where a lot of experimental work has been done. But also those of you who attended my talk yesterday know about the frontal ifeals and prearcuate gyrus here. And of course the midbrain structure, the superior colliculus is here. Sasha here today? Sasha would be pleased to see that the brainstem has been added back onto the brain here. I'm, I'm, it's too bad she's not here. Somebody will have to report to her that I've behaved better today. Um, 
So, you know, I, I'm accustomed to talking about some of this work in front of professional audiences, also to student groups. I give talks, uh, you know, to graduate groups. I teach a course, sort of, that half of it is in, on decision making. And then I make these guest lectures occasionally in undergraduate classes. And it's always an undergraduate who says at some point during the talk or after the talk and, and in the discussion section, graduate students for some reason are too well socialized to ask questions like this. But, but an undergraduate will raise his or her hand and say, what about free will? Uh, you know, if decisions are based on mechanisms like this in the brain and you just have this simple little accumulator accumulating evidence and sort of what you're going to say at the end is, is determined by these uh, neural processes, where, I mean, do we have free will? How do we, how do we wind up thinking about free will? And, you know, I have never had very profound answers to this at all. I've had intuitions. But over the years, I've kind of tried to work out some thoughts and have actually done some, some, t some talks with different audiences uh, and got into this rather deeply when I was participating several years ago in the MacArthur Foundation's National Neuroscience and Law um, uh, uh, initiative and uh, so I'm just going to share with you some of the thoughts that I've had about this today and uh, and s just sort of throw some things up on the wall and see what sticks. Now one answer to this problem of free will is this one. Um, I'm not a fatalist but even if I were what could I do about it? Uh, I don't know who said that originally. Um, <laughs> it sounds like something Woody Allen would say, right? <laughs> uh, so that's that's a flip answer. Um, but a more realistic answer, I think, uh, you know, requires a little more thought than that. And I just want to point out that this is not a new problem, right? We, we have had this problem uh, for years, and our criminal system faces this, because in criminal law, increasingly brain scans, neuroscience evidence is being introduced as evidence that defendants have diminished or no responsibility, so they deserve less punishment. In other words, should we have individualized law in the same way that we are moving toward individualized medicine? It's a very strange concept to think about. But even this is not a new issue, as those of you who remember this guy realize. And this is Charles Whitman, you know, and when I was a kid growing up in Florida, uh, he was the very famous uh, Texas sniper who was an ex-Marine and an undergraduate at the University of Texas and one day he climbed up into this tower with a high-powered rifle and he started shooting people and he, before he turned his gun and killed himself, he had killed 14 other people and wounded about 80. And before this incident, he had actually killed his wife and his mother with a hunting knife. And what was remarkable about Whitman is that he kept a diary, and his diary was found afterwards. And you can read this stuff, just Google Charles Whitman on the web. Uh, but some of these are particularly poignant. So Whitman says, um, you know, several days before he climbed the tower, he actually writes, lately I've been, ha been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. I consulted Dr. Cockrum at the University Health Center and asked him to recommend someone that I could consult with about some psychiatric disorders I felt I had. I talked to a doctor once for about two hours and tried to convey to him my fears that I felt overcome by overwhelming violent impulses. After one session, I never saw the doctor again, and since then I've been fighting my mental turmoil alone and seemingly to no avail. After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed to see if there is any visible physical disorder. So this is a guy who sensed himself losing control and sensed that it might have something to do with his brain. Uh, this is another passage from his notes. It was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight. I love her dearly, and she has been as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. And Charles left another note with the body. If my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts. Donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. And at autopsy, it was actually discovered that he had a tumor. He had a tumor just under the thalamus in a region that impinged both on the hypothalamus and on the amygdala in the medial temporal lobe. And we know that these two structures are part of the limbic system and very important parts of uh, uh, circuits neurobiologically that regulate emotion and affect. And we'll never know, of course, whether this was causally related to Whitman's, Whitman's feelings of irrationality and violent urges. Today, if that were detected in an MR, that would certainly be a, a legitimate evidence in court of diminished responsibility. 
So, you know, the notion that, that uh, our behavior and all of our judgments are deeply linked to the neurobiology is, of course, an, a, a sort of a cardinal tenet among neurobiologists ourselves. But it does raise the question, are, you know, what does freedom mean? What do we mean when we use that term? And are any of us, at, at a deep level, freer, any freer than Whitman was when he was, may have been under the influence of this particular tumor? So then what about free will? How do we think about free will? Are any of us in any sense actually free? And I'm going to sort of consider four approaches to this problem. I'm going to consider sort of bottom-up determinism, and I'm going to say I don't like that one very much. And I'm going to consider, you know, a possible solution that people have uh, suggested through quantum brain, the quantum mechanics, and I'm going to say I don't really like that one very much. And I'm going to consider um, this definition that I think most people on the street run around with, and many of us perhaps, that the definition of freedom and free will somehow means that our behavior is uncaused uh, by anything at a brain level. And I'm going to say I don't like that very much. That's not a definition of freedom for me. I mean, to me, causation does not equal lack of freedom. And what I will argue for is that what freedom means in the deepest sense to me and I think to many other people, if we stop to think about it carefully, it really means self-determination or autonomy. And it doesn't mean a lack of cause. It means that the causes come from certain places within us that we consider core parts of our identity. And we are f most free when our, when our behavior is most pursuant to what we believe to be true about the world, to our ideals, to our goals, to our values. And we're not free when we're under coercion of some sort. Now, I, I talked this summer, actually, at a sort of a neuroscience and philosophy kind of thing, um, and the person who spoke just before me was Peter von Inwagen, a very famous philosopher, who, and he, he is, a, a, at the start, sort of laying his cards on the table. He said, you know, what most neuroscientists have to say about free will is worthless because they never define what they're talking about. And he says, philosophers at least try to define what they're talking about, even though they can never agree on the answer to the question. <laughs> so that was you know, sort of one of my introductions when I, when I got up to speak as a neuroscientist. And you know, I, I want to say just a little bit more about what I think the self-determination or autonomy is about. And, and my core assertion, what, what I require for some sense of freedom, is that my behavior is caused at least in part by my values, my beliefs, my memory, memories, my goals, and my aspirations. Um, and the key use here is of that word cause right there. And we'll have a lot to say about that word cause in just a moment. Um, and I would even go so far as to say conscious rational thought plays a causal role in my behavior. So I don't think that these are sort of folk concepts that are there to be explained away by neuroscience. And I don't envision a neuroscience of the future where we will get, get rid of these terms and we'll have you know, a deeper understanding of the nervous system that will, that will at least uh, enable release of those terms if we want to. I don't believe that and I'll go through why I don't believe that in just a minute. So let's just, I want to step through these four sort of one at a time. Now the bottom-up determinism I'm going to spend uh, the next few minutes on because I find that this is sort of the default model that many of my sci neuroscientific colleagues, and most biologists probably, tend to operate with. And this was described best uh, in this book by Carl Craver, a neurophilosopher published in 2007 called Explaining the Brain. I like this book a lot. It's harder for an experimental neuroscientist to read, but I've read it at least three times and plan to read it again and study it carefully because I find it very rewarding. And Craver lays out this sort of um, intuitive notion that I think most neuroscientists run around with. Um, and it comes from a, what he calls the reduction model that's inspired by early successes in physics. So it's a, the classical model of reduction, and Craver says, according to this classical model, and he credits uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, or is that Ernst Nagel? That's probably Ernst Nagel from 1949 and 1961 as this de classic definition of reduction. And he says, one theory is reduced to another when it is possible to define the theoretical terms of the first with those of the second and to derive the first theory from the second. 
And that's the so-called covering law of uh, nature of explanation. And this is the grand vision to reduce everything we see in the visual world around us down to the four fundamental forces of nature, which in physics are electricity and magnetism, gravity, and the weak and strong nuclear forces. And you know, the notion is that that is at that fundamental level where all causation resides. And Kraber calls this point of view metaphysical fundamentalism. Um, and he says that the metaphysical fundamentalist argues that non-fundamental things have no causal power over and above fundamental things. And the fundamental things are these fundamental forces of physics. They believe roughly that everything has a cause at the fundamental level and that nothing has more than one complete cause. If so, it follows that no non-fundamental things are causes. Non-fundamental things would include things like beliefs, values, aspirations, or goals. They're not really causes. Uh, they, they have the illusion sometimes of being causes, but they should not really be uh, considered as causes. And this is the classic model of reduction, and, and I think that it's the one that unconsciously uh, many scientists run around with all the time. Now, I have problems with fundamentalist reduction. I have several problems, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go over them at some length here for the next few minutes, simply because I do find, I, 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 I believe that this is the dominant model. My first problem with it is it doesn't work in real life. And I'm suspicious of any deep doctrine that doesn't work in real life. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not right, uh, but uh, it's a mark against it at the very least. I like the example, the little intuition pump that John Searle gives. He says, imagine being in a restaurant, waiter asks you, uh, you know, which, which uh, entree will you be having, ma'am or sir? And you say, well, you know, I've become, I'm a sort of a bottom-up person. I've become convinced that all causality is bottom-up, and these decision things are just stories that we tell ourselves. And I'm just going to sit here and let my nervous system produce the answer. It always has in the past, and I believe it will now. <laughs> and, you know, you just sit there. And that, of course, you're never going to get any food that evening if, if, if you believe that and act that way. And, it, and so that doesn't work in real life. Um, and, and again, here's another problem, a deep problem I have, is that this covering law model, thinking that you can actually reduce, completely reduce a theory at one level to a theory at another level and, and derive the higher level from the first, that doesn't describe what we neuroscientists do. I mean, maybe it will one day in the future, I don't know, I doubt it, but it certainly doesn't describe what we do now. The genius of neuroscience is creating, is identifying mechanisms, and mechanisms, I'll argue, always involve links between levels, and causal relations go up and down across those levels, and again, I'll unpack that in a moment. Um, and then there's always a regression issue. Whose fundamental level is actually fundamental? We neuroscientists tend to think that systems or circuits of neurons are really what's fundamental, although some of us would really say, no, the only thing that's really fundamental are action potentials, single neurons, and synapses, and it's just components of those, it's assemblies of those elements uh, everything on top of that is phenomenology, and it's the neuron that's fundamentally. But of course, there are geneticists uh, who would say that that uh, it's the genetic level that's really fundamental. And I had a, a, one of my neuroscience colleagues at Stanford, whom all of you neuroscientists would instantly recognize, tell me recently that he did not believe any fundamental advance had been made in the history of neuroscience that didn't involve genetic techniques or refer back to genes. <laughs> uh, that, that is a literal quote. And I turned to him and I said, X, and I won't say X's name, I said, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. And the dinner conversation kind of went downhill from there. Um, so, um, you know, there's this regression problem. Where do you want to stop? Everybody, want, when you start that regression, everyone wants to stop at their favorite spot, right? Um, so, and then, and then here's another problem, and Craver points this out in his book, that the most fundamental level, if we're really going to regress all the way down to, to basic physics and our fundamental, our most fundamental physical theory about the world today is quantum mechanics, the most fundamental level is arguably a causal. And this, it doesn't involve cause and effect at all. We can't even talk about cause. And this point was made in a famous essay by Bertrand Russell on the notion of cause, Proceedings of the Aristotelian Society in 1913. I'm going to show you a big part of this quote just because it's so damned elegantly phrased. You know, I wish I could say things like this, but I can't. But so Russell is arguing with this dude, Dr. James Ward, uh, who's a philosopher. And Russell says, in advanced sciences, such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never occurs. 
Dr. James Ward, in his naturalism and agnosticism, makes this a ground of complaint against physics. The business of those who wish to ascertain the ultimate truth about the world, he apparently thinks, should be the discovery of causes, and yet physics never even seeks them. And Russell says, to me, it seems that philosophy ought not to assume such legislative functions, and that the reason why physics has ceased to look for causes is, the fact, is that, in fact, there are no such things. The law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. So his point really is that in an equation like F equals MA, you can just as easily say M equals F over A or A equals F over M. You can put things on any side of the equation you want to, and time is not implicitly involved there. I mean, the only major law of um, that, that explicitly involves time is entropy, things tending to, toward a state of disorder. But that in, in much of basic physics, according to Russell and some other people, uh, you know, if you really want to go down to the fundamental level, they would argue causality becomes irrelevant. Um, so look, those are, those are part of my problems. And the last one that I'll cite is what I call the poverty of quantum mechanics. And I don't mean that quantum mechanics is wrong. That would be stupid to sit up here and, and say. But I do believe it's impoverished. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that in principle, you know, if we really believe in this fundamental thing, that, that real truth is grasped at the most fundamental level, uh, in principle, we want to get down to quantum mechanical descriptions of everything. So if we were smart enough and we had enough uh, computing power or whatever, in principle, we could write a quantum mechanical wave equation that would predict the motion of every atom in this room over the next 10 minutes. Now, it would be a probabilistic equation and a probabilistic prediction because that's the way quantum mechanics is. But in principle, you could write that thing down and you could say, okay, that's fundamental reality about this room. And those are the things that captures the deepest, broadest truth about this room. And when I say it's impoverished, what I mean is that if you were in possession of that equation, uh, you would know nothing about human beings, you would know nothing about thirst, you'd know nothing about chairs, you'd know nothing about brains, you'd know nothing about intellectual curiosity. All you would know about is the probabilistic motions of systems of atoms. Okay? And to me, that just seems impoverished. And it seems like we lose something if we go to that level of description, something that's highly worth it. I mean, we lose almost everything of interest that's actually going on in this room. So, so it's not that it's wrong. If what you really want to know about is the motions of atoms, the wave equation may be your, your vehicle. Um, I wouldn't even necessarily argue that. If you want to know about the motion of atoms in my, in, in, that comprise the bill system up here, but you probably want to want this thing, you know, that has my calendar in it, and that's probably going to give you much more predictive uh, uh, power than the wave equation would. But for all of these reasons, I, you know, my everything screams that somehow there's something wrong with this fundamentalist reduction that, um, you know doesn't get at the truth of what neuroscientists do and doesn't work in real life and is arguably suspect on other grounds. So that's my reason for drawing a, um, a stop mark through bottom-up determinism. And another one is the quantum brain, and I'll have much less to say about this. I doubt that the quantum brain is, going, is, a, is a way to really understand human freedom for two reasons. One reason is I've talked to a lot of biophysicists about this particular issue, and there are biophysicists in this room, I'm sure, who are much smarter and know much more than I do. And the consensus seems to be that these macromolecules that open and close in nerve membranes and actually allow currents to flow through are so massive that they're really living in a Newtonian world, not in a quantum mechanical world. The quantum mechanical effects are too small in macromolecules, the channel proteins, to really have any serious influence on neural signaling in the brain. Uh, so from a biophysical point of view, this is suspect. Now, everyone agrees there's stochasticity, but the noise in the brain is thermal noise. It's not quantum mechanical noise, is, seems to be the, the general wisdom. Uh, the second reason that I don't like uh, quantum explanations is that quantum mechanics is fundamentally about stochasticity or randomness, and I don't find stochasticity or randomness to be any more intrinsically meaningful than complete bottom-up determination. Pat Churchland kind of highlights this issue in her book Brainwise, the chapter on free will, and I like this quote from Pat, I agree with it. 
Pat says that if your brain generated, because of quantum mechanics, occasional random, uncharacteristic behavior, that would not be a paradigm for free, responsible behavior. Behavior that has internal causes, consistent with our history, our motivations, preferences, goals, beliefs, etc., are properly considered free. Random behavior would convince me that someone is messing with my mind. <laughs> Right? And I feel the same way. I mean, if I go out to cross the street after this talk and, I, and there's a car coming, I want to see it every time. I don't want to have some quantum mechanical event come along and cause me to miss it one in a hundred times and get smashed as a result. I want reliable mechanisms in my brain when it comes to vision and identifying oncoming cars. Uh, Pat says in, later in the chapter, David Hume, made the deeper and more penetrating observation that an agent's choices are not considered freely made unless they are caused by his desires, intentions, and so forth. So coercion that, that, that um, departs, makes your behavior depart from these desires, intentions, values, beliefs, those, that kind of coercion is what in the end makes you unfree. So for those two reasons, I'm, I'm not very attracted to the quantum brain. Now, I'm going to have even less to say about this one. This is fundamentally dualism, and as most of us neuroscientists are not dualists, we don't want to be, although I've had two neuroscientists confess to me in the past five years they are dualists, um, and you know, it's not a popular thing to be as a neuroscientist, and fundamentally, most of us neuroscientists are operating under what I would call the central dogma of neuroscience. This is the assumption we make when we walk into the lab every day, and if we didn't make this assumption, many of us would close up, close up our labs and go home. Um, and the central dogma, I would say, is that all of our behavior and all of our mental life, including our sense of a conscious, continuing self, is inextricably linked to the biology of the brain. Now, I've chosen my words very carefully there. I, I did, it's not determined. I didn't put determined in there because I've already argued that I don't want to go on this infinite regression uh, of, of fundamentalist uh, determinism. But it is inextricably linked to the biology of the brain. I don't believe that there's a mental world out there and then a physical world in the brain and that somehow, in Cartesian fashion, they had to find a way to interact. So, I don't buy this business that freedom is uncaused. If that's our definition of freedom, mind you, if, if, if it is, then I don't believe in it, okay? So it's, it's, the key question to me is, is what counts as a cause? And I'll unpack that more in just a moment. And as I said, I think that the thing that we're all sort of uh, intuitively think about with freedom in our behavior is the notion of self-determination or autonomy, or at least that's what I would like to get to some neuroscientific understanding of, if possible. So is there hope for doing that? Um, I think there's some hope. And there, here's some just preliminary thoughts that I want to lay out. These are just kind of background assumptions that I start with. And the first issue I've already alluded to is what, what is it that counts as a cause? And if it's only the four fundamental forces of physics, then I give up, I quit. Uh, but can we make a cause for what Carl Craver ca it, it describes as non-fundamental causation? Okay, that there's, it, that there's meaningful uh, causative power and meaningful causative control of behavior at higher levels. And I'm going to argue yes. Here's another background assumption that I make, uh, and I think most biologists would probably sign on to this uh, if they think about it for 30 seconds. Um, wholes are more than the sum of parts, and you hear that phrase a lot, but look at the by virtue of. By virtue of the organizational of causally interacting components, and I've italicized organization here. Wholes have causal powers that parts do not, and I don't even think this is controversial. I think that a lion has the causal power to end my life, to kill me. I think that a pile of lion parts does not have the causal power to end my life. If those parts are organized together in a particular way, the lion can end my life, but the parts themselves don't have that power. Similarly, a computer has the power to run PowerPoint, but a bucket full of transistors and pieces does not have the ability or the power to run PowerPoint. It's the organization, it's the way those components are hooked together that really generates new causal powers at higher levels. And this organization thing is a funny thing to think about. Uh, in the abstract, it's information. I mean, uh, and it's reducible in individual instances to lower levels, but not in the general case. Now, what do I mean by that? 
What I mean is that right now PowerPoint is running in this computer, for example, but if I shut it down and I start PowerPoint up again, it's likely to occupy a very different set of transistors. In any one moment, I can say, okay, PowerPoint is equal to the summed activity of the dynamical activity of a particular set of transistors, but the next time I start it up, it's not going to be the same set of transistors. If I move it to another computer out there, it's not even going to be in the same machine. Uh, PowerPoint can be written out in code, though it's so many hundreds of thousands of lines long now, nobody actually does that. But it can be particles on a disk, it can take many, many different forms, uh, and still, it's the same thing. When I go and buy PowerPoint at a, uh, my local Mac store or whatever, you know, I buy this little, this little uh, DVD or CD and I buy this little piece of thing, but as soon as I've transferred the information into this machine, I throw that thing away. I keep the serial number. It's not the substrate I'm buying, it's the information that I'm buying, right? And, and it's that, that thing that has meaning. You can think about it the same thing in terms of any sort of musical tune, uh, you know, for Elise, or whatever your favorite tune is. What is for Elise? Well, it's very difficult to reduce just to uh, particular notes because it can be played in different keys with different notes, yet it's recognizably the same thing. It's very difficult to reduce to air vibrations because in a different concert hall, it'll have somewhat different air vibrations. It can even be written down on a piece of paper. It can be on a computer disc. Um, but yet there is a thing called for a lease uh, that is, at a, is organized information about tonal relationships and is not reducible in the general case. So the organization point is very important to me. And the sort of feeling that emerges from these kinds of considerations is that fundamental laws like physics, the laws of physics, constrain possible actions of a complex system, but they do not determine the behavior of the complex system. So uh, there are certain fundamental laws that simply can't be violated. Nothing can happen in this computer that's disallowed by Kirchhoff's laws of current flows and circuits. Nothing can happen in this computer that's disallowed by, by transistor physics. Uh, but while all those laws constrain what the computer is doing, they don't determine it. What determines it in the deepest sense are the logical patterns of symbol manipulation represented by the software. Uh, so those are sort of some preliminary thoughts, and now let's just go ahead and consider this last assertion that I made a while ago that many of you probably found, many of you neuroscientists may have found provocative, that neuroscientific explanation is intrinsically multi-level. It is not intrinsically reductive, it's intrinsically multi-level. Now, Terry Sanowski has made this point himself at times, and I don't know whether he would be willing to go as far with this point as I'm going to go in the next couple of slides, but, um, but he certainly, to my mind, edges in this direction. So this is an example, again, I adapted this from Craver. This isn't exactly his, uh, his, his line here, but you could argue that something like long-term spatial memory is one of the best examples of the ability of neuroscience to explain some behavioral or psychological phenomenon at a physical level. And so long-term spatial memory is our explanandum. This is the thing that we'd like to explain. And when we neuroscientists go to study long-term spatial memory, usually what we do, the very first thing we do, we, we, we don't study it in the abstract, we study it in a particular system, a particular animal that's doing some memory task or a human being who's doing some memory task. So we start by defining a system and that's frequently something like a mouse navigating a water maze. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a circular swimming pool of milky water and somewhere hidden under the surface of the water is a little pedestal and you put a mouse in this water and he swims, 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 swims around until he finds the pedestal. He climbs up on the pedestal so he's no longer swimming. It's called a water maze because you can move the pedestal around and the mouse will learn where it is and he'll remember it and gradually he'll go straight to it and then you move it around and he'll learn the new location and this, this, his ability to go straight to it after about 10 10, 15, 20 trials is an example, you know, an operational example of, sp of long-term spatial memory. So we get this thing, this is the way neuroscience works, we get this behavioral thing going, and then we start saying, well, what part of the brain is enabling the mouse to do this? And, you know, we know a lot now about uh, the, the hippocampus and the fact that it's generating a spatial map that seems to be critically involved in a mouse's ability to learn to navigate a new water maze. And of course, then we want to know things about what underlies the hippocampus. 
And uh, we have learned that the, me the mechanism of plasticity in the hippocampus probably involves neurons that are expressing synaptic plasticity in the form of long-term potentiation. Now there are many mechanisms of synaptic plasticity, but LTP is a classic one. And um, many of us, th and there's some gaps here, there's still some controversy here, but many of us think that the mechanism of change in the spatial map when the mouse is placed in a new environment involves LTP. Well, how does LTP work? Well, we know that NMDA receptors, a particular kind of receptor in the postsynaptic membrane, are extremely important for expressing LTP. And we also know that those NMDA receptors uh, are, are increased in their population or decreased under genetic control. So that ultimately, we have this multi-level explanation of long-term spatial memory, and it involves these levels. And I think what we neuroscientists do, our genius really, is understanding mechanisms. We're after mechanisms, and the mechanisms are the causal links between these two, between, between, the, different er between the different levels. Now, where I don't know whether Terry would agree with me or not, uh, is about these arrows that I've drawn here, uh, talking about causal relevance. And it's an article of faith for all of us that causal relevance runs from the bottom up here, that you know these, recept these genetic uh, activity uh, creates these NMDA receptor populations and they induce long-term potentiation, that modifies the map, that leads to the mouse learning the water maze, and there we go, bingo, we have long-term spatial memory. But my argument, and I'm following Craver on this, is that Causal relationships or causally relevant relationships also go from the bottom down. Uh, and the key concept here is, um, is mutual, mutual manipulation. And the, the key concept is the definition of a mechanism. So what is a mechanism really? And Craver suggests that one of the key parts is this phrase right here, mutual manipulability. And he says, a part is a component in a mechanism if one can change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole by intervening to change the component, right? That sounds like what we neuroscientists do. We like to tweak some lower level process and see that we get an effect at the higher level. But this is a big and right here. And one can change the behavior of the component by intervening to change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. And when these levels are mutually manipulable like this, uh, then we become convinced that we're getting something to the truth of the mechanism. And Carl simply calls this making a difference. You know, where, I mean, in a way, this is the classic scientist instinct. Where can I go into a system and turn a knob and get a predictable uh, outcome? And I think as neuroscientists, we do this all the time. So I think that you know, we can change the system at this level. We can drop this mouse into a new water maze, and we predict, and would be very disappointed if it didn't happen, that the hippocampus generates a new spatial map. Uh, with optogenetics, we could potentially impose a different spatial map on the hippocampus, and we would be, uh, you know, we would be very disappointed if that didn't ultimately result in some changes in long-term synaptic connections like LTP. Uh, so, it, it, manipulating at these higher levels causes a cascade of changes at the lower levels, uh, and that's part of what it means to be a mechanism. That you, you, if you manipulate here, you get changes here, and if you manipulate here, you get changes here, and if either of those links fails, you suspect that you're not really onto a mechanism. And that resonates to me, what I do in a lab. It resonates to me a lot more than the covering law which says that ultimately, you know, we can take rules about the hippocampus and the spatial map, and when we really understand LTP well enough, we can basically abandon this because we will have reduced the theory of hippocampus and spatial maps to a theory of LTP. And I don't see anybody doing that. I've never seen any neuroscientist do something that would make one of these levels go away in the sense of the Nagelian covering law. So this is a key part of, of my argument here that what we neuroscientists do is actually involved in establishing causal relevance between levels. So I've gone deep in the weeds here for a public lecture and I'm gonna start coming up out of the weeds now. And I'm going to say, what does all of this mean? I, I can read the air bubbles over your heads, you know, the little bubbles and you're thinking, what does all of this mean? I lost track of what's at stake here. Well, remember what's at stake here is can we think meaningfully about non-fundamental causation? And this is critical to my mind for 
establishing self-determination and autonomy as meaningful concepts and, and responsibility, therefore, as a meaningful concept. And the key issue, the absolute key issue, is what counts as a cause. Are the causes only those four fundamental laws of physics, or can we think about causality and causal relationships moving up and down chains of mechanism and recognize the fact that what we neuroscientists do in the lab actually involves going both ways. If we can find a way to talk meaningfully about non-fundamental causation, and I think we must, then we can take uh, mental causation and responsibility itself seriously. Uh, this is not to say, hear me well, this is not to say that bottom-up causes are unimportant. I, th I hope nobody thinks I believe that. But I do think that explanatory relevance runs both upward and downward inside of nested mechanisms. Okay, so let's look at some examples here. Here's a famous quote from Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, which is, you know, an extremely reductionistic view of uh, genes and their role, their relationship to organisms. And Dawkins says, genes swarm in huge colonies, safe inside gigantic lumbering robots, sealed off from the outside world, communicating with it by torturous indirect routes, manipulating it by remote control. They are in you and me, they created us body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. All right, so that's bottom-up language, talking about genes and the organisms that they're a part of. But Dennis Noble wrote a book called The Music of Life, and he's deliberately um, paraphrasing Dawkins here in a beautiful passage from his book. And Noble says, genes are trapped inside huge colonies, locked inside highly intelligent beings, molded by the outside world, communicating with it by complex processes through which blindly as if by magic function emerges. They are in you and me. We are the system that allows their code to be read and their preservation is totally dependent on the joy that we experience in reproducing ourselves. <laughs> we are the ultimate rationale for their existence. You know, this is looking at the same set of facts, but looking at it from a top-down perspective rather than a bottom-up perspective. And I don't feel like, you know, the argument I've just made, I think, I don't feel like we have to choose between these two perspectives. I think if you really look at what biologists do in laboratories, I think we're running in both directions, up and down this, letter, this ladder of, of nested mechanisms. Here's another example I'll give you from the real world. I was really startled and pleased. Uh, most of you know about the Lasker Awards. These are sort of a, the highest biomedical award given out each year in the United States. And many people who've won the Lasker Prize go on to win the Nobel Prize, given out by the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. And I was amazed uh, to see this Lasker Award story in the New York Times in September of 2006 uh, stating that this guy uh, is, was among the five people chosen to win the Lasker Award. This guy is Aaron Beck, who's a psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is famous as the inventor of cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is an intervention, a way to treat uh, 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 chronic depression strictly at a behavioral level. And what's really interesting is that this, was, this won a Lasker Award. I mean, psychiatry went through this molecular revolution in the 70s and 80s as we started uncovering receptors and transmitter systems, and every psychiatrist became a writer of prescriptions and threw away much of the talk therapy that had been, you know, our only recourse for decades prior to that. And a uh, psychiatry resident at the time who, who was training, he was, in, he was training at Stanford, but he was a resident and doing research in my lab, most of you would know, most of my neuroscience colleagues know this guy. But, you know, I asked him what he had learned in class today, you know, after he'd been to the clinic or whatever. And he says, you know, his motto as a psychiatrist is, leave no receptor unoccupied. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, this is a bottom-up view, right? But, but Aaron, Beck's, Aaron Beck's is a very much a top-down view. And the interesting thing that's happened scientifically with the publication of this paper in 2000 and a similar one a couple of years later confirming this for juveniles, uh, it's a comparison of 
of a classic um, drug treatment for depression, a comparison of the drug treatment alone, the cognitive behavioral analysis system of psychotherapy, and their combination for the treatment of chronic depression. And the outcome of the study is very clear that chronic depression is treated when both of these are used in concert than when either is, treat is used alone. Now, that of course isn't, this is a statistical thing across a large patient population. It may not be true for e any individual person, but on the balance, the combination of the bottom-up intervention, that is administering drugs that occupy receptors, and the top-down intervention, that is trying to restructure a person's beliefs about the nature of the world, they're more effective at treating depression when used together. So, this, 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 these bottom-up interventions are the core of modern molecular psychiatry, and they're extremely important, and they've been extremely useful for many, many patients. But the top-down intervention is also important, and Aaron Beck actually said, you know, that his whole program was cognitive restructuring. That, that's what his whole program is about, about changing people's beliefs about the world, and if you could change the cognitive approach to the world, that frequently the feelings would come along with it after the cognitive uh, restructuring. So I think beliefs matter, okay? And I think that values matter. And I think they don't just matter because they're sort of airy-fairy things that, you know, we can't live without somehow. And I don't believe that they matter because they're just uh, sort of stories we make up to lay down on top of behavior. I believe they matter because they're real entities in the nervous system, that they correspond to high, high levels of organization in the nervous system, and one day we'll understand them in the same way that we understand long-term memory. We'll understand them in terms of nested mechanisms, and we'll understand that the top high levels of organization, and it's this organization concept that is so critical, that it plays causal roles just as much as the bottom-up influences from physics and genes and single neurons. Um, I would also argue, and I'm not going to take the time to do it right now because I know that I'm running out of time here, that taking beliefs seriously as real entities has scientific advantages. It has advantages that, that matter to science itself. It's parsimonious. Uh, you know, stating that Bill believes this lecture needs to be over with in, you know, five minutes uh, will allow you, it's a parsimonious statement that allows you to make predictions and it allows you to manipulate. So if Pam Reinagle said, no, 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 Bill, take, go ahead and take until one o'clock, it would change my beliefs and it would lengthen this talk. And she's not going to say that, so you'll be relieved, <laughs> relieved to know that. Uh, but by the very values that matter to us as scientists, parsimony, prediction, and manipulation, I think beliefs should be taken seriously as real causal entities. And this is a guy who actually got this, who understood this. This is Tolstoy, you know, in his most, uh, his greatest book, his masterpiece was War and Peace. And in one of the sort of culminating uh, passages in War and Peace, one of the protagonist Pierre, I guess his name is, is in Moscow and he's facing this firing squad. And he's trying to say, you know, why is this happening? Why? Am I, uh, why is my life ending right now? And he looked into the eyes of the young men who were nervously pointing their guns at him, and he said, evidently they don't want to do this. Uh, they much prefer to be somewhere else. They're not really the cause. What's the cause, you know? And just tried to reason about the cause. And, you know, the conclusion was, who, who was it that had really sentenced him to death? And he says it wasn't any single piece of this. It was a system. It was an organized system, a concurrence of circumstances. And Tolstoy had a systems view of causality in ways that um, I hope more neuroscientists come to in the long run. Um, so I think that understanding the, the nature of human freedom, what we mean by it, and what underlying mechanisms can give us um, a, a biologically responsible but humanly responsible way to talk about freedom, I think that's the most important problem and issue facing the neurobehavioral sciences. Um, and I think that it's important for obvious reasons of human dignity and social responsibility, but I would go further and make the argument that it's critical also for science itself. I think if we're going to do science, and if we believe that we can uh, get to something approaching you know, ob objective, real truth about nature and about mechanisms, uh, we have to believe that 
to some extent, we have this ability to be self-determinative and autonomous. And uh, if we don't, we're in a deep contradiction that was summed up in one of my two favorite quotes from J.B.S. Haldane, who was a very famous geneticist in the middle of the 20th century. And so this is one of my two. You can ask me about the other favorite quote later if, you, if you're interested. But this is my, probably my favorite one. Haldane says, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of the atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true and hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Um, and that's the kind of logical conundrum that we get into. So that's the sum total of what I have to say on this topic. I obviously, I think it's an important topic. I, of course, have not solved it. And um, I just hope to point some ways that I, I, as a neuroscientist, think might hold some constructive promise for thinking about these problems in the future. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have. Great question. And the answer is there is no reason to stop at any lower level of organization. So the key issue to me here is what, what is your explanandum? What is it that you're actually trying to explain? And um, come on, machine. I have a quantum mechanical event going on inside of PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, so there are levels, many levels above and below this. So as you point out, there are many levels going up up here, and uh, everything critically depends on what's your explanandum. What is it that you're trying to explain? And it may be that some light gets thrown on long-term spatial memory by watching how single organisms operate in groups of organisms. So, you know, there might be something up here above the mouse navigating a water maze that would throw light on long-term spatial memory, and I would say, if so, go for it. I think that after you get too many levels removed from this, uh, the relationship between what's going on up here in economic systems, perhaps, and long-term spatial memory in an individual organism, that link will become so remote that adding more information up here doesn't really help you much more in your understanding of long-term spatial memory. And I would say the same thing down here. Now, the fundamentalist notion, right, the metaphysical fundamental notion is, is don't stop here for crying out loud. Keep going. I mean, there are many levels of chemistry. There are many levels of physics. And we got to get right on down there to quantum mechanics. If you really believe that the fullest, deepest, most profound explanation of things lies at the most fundamental level, then, boy, there are levels. There's a lot of work to do down here. But I would say if you go much below this level, uh, you're not, you know, all the facts you learn down here are not taking you closer to understanding long-term spatial memory. They're actually taking you further away, okay? They're filling your mind with lots of distracting facts that probably have very little relevance to understanding long-term spatial memory. So I totally buy your point that there are many levels above and many levels below, and which ones you choose to engage depends on exactly what your explanation is. Yeah. Um, multiple instantiability of physical substrate, uh, the infinite regression problem, but you're not providing any arguments against functionalism. So perhaps coming from neurobiology, that's not something that's even on your radar screen, but a lot of us come from disciplines where it's very much still alive. Yeah. So how are you situating yourself? Yeah, okay. So debate? so I, I have to confess and beg ignorance on a lot of this. Um, I know roughly what functionalism is, and I find some of their arguments attractive, but I don't find attractive the notion that, for example, if we want to know long -term, what long-term spatial memory is, what I don't find attractive is that if we can build an abstract model of it and really um, understand the algorithms that are being uh, instantiated, I don't buy the argument that all of this becomes irrelevant. Because I don't think we can actually infer all of these physical mechanisms just from functionalist structures and algorithms. So I'm, you know, I am a biologist at heart, and I want to know what these things act, act down here actually do. Um, 
but I confess that I don't know the isms and the ists well enough to position myself the way you would like me to do. And I, I would love to be able to do that. I would like to, I should take some classes, you know, and really, really learn this stuff. Uh, but I'm just sort of trying to put this forward as one neuroscientist view, trying to reason, and following Carl Craver a lot, and trying to reason about what we do and some general outlooks. What I get really impatient with are neuroscientists who discover cool mechanisms, but then run around telling people, uh, you know, you don't really have long-term spatial memory. What you really have is LTP, or run around telling people you don't really have beliefs. What you really have is, you know, X, Y, or Z. And I consider that kind of, um, you know, reductionism a very uh, philosophically poor and scientifically inaccurate message to give to the public. And I'm just trying to create some space here from a neuroscientific point of view. So Terry. So you gave an example, yeah. actually, which I think illustrates the point you're trying to make. You use your computer, yeah. PowerPoint, as an example of how what's important is the information, not yeah. where it is in the machine. Yeah. That's a bad analogy for the brain. Okay. And the reason is you can't take someone's uh, operating system or with the bits of the memory and download it into somebody else's brain. It's not going to work. There's something, in, there's something concrete about the fact that that brain has those memories <coughs> And uh, that's different from software, which runs on any computer. Yes. That's, that's, that's a real yes. big difference between yes. those two different. Yes. And I think you're actually yeah. don't you're not a functionalist. I don't. Think. <laughs> <laughs> but you're using a functionalist argument. Right? Okay. Okay. So in any case, I think that's what he's getting at. Okay. So so let let me just comment on that. Um, uh, I of course perfectly understand that software and hardware are very different things in a computer and that a very different thing about the brain is that there is no cleavage between software and hardware and it's the brain operates more like a dynamical system in the ways that we were talking with and alluding to yesterday so that's a metaphor not a direct analogy uh, but I also use the organization of a piece of music as a metaphor not a direct analogy and I think that aspects of that metaphor are going to be uh, in the end, applicable to the brain, even though it's not a direct analogy. So, um, I, I think I, I actually I agree with the point you were making with the metaphor, except yeah. that you have to be careful not to take it too literally, right? Okay. All right. It would be a mistake to take me too literally. <laughs> Ralph. So, depending on what, how you define beliefs, yeah. there's nothing about what you're describing that is uniquely human. Yeah. And depending how you define beliefs, well, it seems to me determines how far in the animal kingdom you would take this. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. Great question. One Pam just asked me this morning. Um, so I'm willing to take this pretty far in the animal kingdom. Um, I think that, uh, you know, certainly higher mammals have capability for flexible behavior and context sensitive behavior and behavior that can be modified depending on their specific goals at the moment and, you know, flexibility, context responsiveness. Uh, and the lower you go in the animal kingdom and where behaviors become more routinized in the command neuron sense, one neuron fires and this behavior follows obligatorily, then the degrees of freedom and the flexibility of behavior become less and less. But I'm, I perfectly believe that animals have choices and make choices all the time and that they're not uh, perfectly determined by bottom-up uh, forces of physics, but that the higher levels of organization of animal brains endow these, well, like a mouse, you know, in a water maze, that these bi-directional understandings of mechanism uh, are operating in the mouse and even on down into the insect community, in insect uh, kingdom at times. So I'm quite willing to buy. I don't, I don't, in, I don't, as, I mean, you know, all of us who are biologists, I think, have this instinctive feeling that there is a lot of continuity in the animal kingdom, and there's not going to be specific cleavage points where you say, aha, this important stuff exists on one side and it doesn't exist on the other side. So, how about flies? If I went to flies, would... I, I, I think you're being far too conservative. Paramecia make choices. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are people in this room who would say that uh, developing axon uh, terminals make choices. Growth cones make choices. They cross the midline and they choose whether to go left or choose whether to go right. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty liberal for a monkey guy. <laughs> um, was, did, I, did I? I have a question. Ah, sorry, Sasha. Did you see, were you here? You, you came in late, didn't you? I, I just missed the first five minutes. 
Yeah, that, I, I restored the brain stem on the brain, <laughs> on the brain slide. Great, right. so thank you for that, that, that bi-direction, the recognition of the bi-direction yes. the bi -direction interaction <laughs> okay. between the cortex and what the cortex observes. <laughs> the question I have is a, a, is a combination philosophical, psychological question. And um, uh, uh, and there's some personal elements in it too, which, which is that it, it seems that, that mostly people in power are very secure with reductionism, but the complexity of back and forth interactions, which Nick Spitzer showed so beautifully in development, a handshake between calcium entry and gene expression and gene expression and calcium entry, and that goes all the way up and down the neuraxis out to life. But that, that, the combination of that sort of complexity and then the probabilistic nature uh -huh. of things Yep. Um, uh, um, it, it's just really, it seems like it's very challenging for, for many people. And that, that, so for example, Bob Tejan, mm -hmm. head of Pews, said that all of the fundamental problems in biology will be solved at the level of molecular interactions. Now, I don't believe that. You don't believe that. Nope. I doubt that most of the people in this room really truly believe that, and yet funding Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so what can we, what what is it, and what can we do about this? Ah, uh, you know, just just uh, do what I did at dinner and tell Professor X that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't I don't think I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have a good answer, Sasha. I mean, this is deep. I mean, this is ingrained in um, many many modern biologists, and maybe there are people out there who want to stand up and speak in favor of this, uh, uh, this you know, highly reductionist point of view. I mean, you can point out the contradictions uh, that why stop at genes, you know, why are, why are genes and molecules so important? Why not the chemistry under them and then the physics under them? I mean, I, the, the problem is everybody wants to stop the regression at their own favorite level. But once you commit yourself to that intellectual program, I don't see any reason to stop at any particular level. So no one's given me a good one yet anyway. So I, I don't know. Do we just... Um, Maybe we need a generation change. You know, progress is made one death at a time or something. Yeah. Right? So when I'm looking at the bidirectionality, I completely agree, but I don't, I'm not sure if it's direct. Mm -hmm. So when you think about if you have a mouse navigating a water maze, and then you say, oh, well, if you put them in a new water maze, that's going to affect yeah. the spatial map. But when I think about how that happens, it's more mm -hmm. like a circle back around through the bottom. Yes. You know, the photons come into the eye, and they get set to the retina, but at the end, you know, everything. Yep, totally. And comes back through maybe right. the bottom. So right, right. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. So there's no, there's no magic here, right? I'm not postulating magic anywhere here. And these, these mechanisms are interacting at multiple levels as the animal's behavior unfolds in life and as the animal learns a new maze. In fact, Craver, Craver would say that uh, in, in his book, and I haven't thought through this deeply yet, but it, Craver would say that all of these things are happening simultaneously. They don't, they don't happen at different points in time. There's no one that leads to another that leads to another. That as a mouse learns a new maze, all of these things are happening simultaneously. So that action's going on at all of these levels at, at the same time. So I would agree with you that, you know, all levels are involved all the time. Terry. I, I Terry's it. very eager. Yeah, I, I love the levels. <laughs> were, were, you, were you here when I first put these up and said, Terry, you know, part of this was inspired by Terry. I'm not sure if he would go with the I, I, arrows I, I in both I, directions. You know, take me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So but there's an interesting um, asymmetry here about these levels, okay. which is that as you go down, there are more and more degrees of freedom. That is to say, the, the dimensionality yes. of, the, of the, yes. the capacity to be able to absorb uh, information coming down is increased all the way down, and, and, it, and it continues. And so I think that's a clue to what, how to think about this, is that um, you take something that is uh, maybe a simple behavior, turn right or turn left, as you, but that's being instantiated uh, you know, in the map at, in terms of uh, 
maybe small populations in the hippocampus, maybe other places too. But as you go down into the molecular level, now you're talking about billions of synapses, yeah. tr you know, trillions, you know, gazillions of molecules. It's not just one MD receptor. It's, you know, they're all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, there's an interesting um, kind of uh, progression down. And by the way, yeah. when you go up, you're taking all that information in the molecules and you're compressing it. Exactly. To, to, to fewer invariables at the, the higher level until you turn right or left. Right, exactly. And so what do you conclude from that? I mean, I, I, okay, I agree I, totally with my, your observations. Okay, my, what, do you, what do you want to infer okay, from that? My conclusion is you need to have model this. <laughs> <laughs> we need more funding no, no, for theory. <laughs> so how do you actually bridge it? The problem is that if you're dealing with hippocampus spatial maps, that's a different level of description. It has different variables and yes, different yes. You know, measurements and terms yes. than the uh, LTP, where you're talking about the uh, NMDA receptors. Yes. So you have to have a model of the NMDA receptors. You have to have a model of the spatial the neurons in the spatial map. And you have to bridge between those two levels by showing how one model actually is able to predict or be able to integrate across those two levels. Yes. Okay, so I, I mean, I like that conclusion. I like that inference. Here's, here's an, an, an inference I would make that for this. And so for those of you who are not, uh, those of you who are neuroscientists primarily, uh, Terry, you're talking about, I mean, I, you're talking about what philosophers would describe as multiple realizability. I think, so that, you know, that something that actually can be described very compactly at a high level, uh, like my belief that the world is round, that the earth is round, uh, every time that belief occurs in my head, it's probably going to have, it, it could have thousands or even millions of different instantiations at the lower level. It could be a p different particular set of neurons that are firing, and certainly if the same neurons are firing, they're gonna be firing action potentials at different times. And certainly, even if the action potentials are firing at roughly the same times, it's gonna be different populations of ion channel molecules opening that lead to threshold crossings, right? There's all this stochasticity. So my belief that the world is round can have literally thousands of different, when you go down where those low degree of freedom are can literally have thousands of different descriptions. And that's one reason that I say that, that beliefs and a reason to take them seriously as scientists is that they're parsimonious. Uh, you know, generally we prefer parsimonious explanations or accounts to ones that say, you know, you know, if, if, if we say that Bill's leaving to go home on Friday because, you know, he's got a shitload of work to do at Stanford having lounged around in San Diego all week. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's predictive, it's parsimonious uh, as opposed to a neuroscientific or a quantum mechanical description. It allows predictions and it allows you to manipulate. I mean, so I, I take, I agree 100% with your point, and I think I'm going a little, running a little further with it. Maybe I'm running in a functionalist direction uh, uh, that, you know, these higher levels somewhere, that's, that's where the real explanatory power lies and where you want to manipulate the system. So it's, these are, these are, arguments that would be familiar to anyone in statistical mechanics, right, where the ideal gas law that we all learn in high school compactly describes the behavior of a gas under different conditions of temperature, volume, and pressure. And, you know, it has some isomorphism in all probability with the collective motions of each individual atom of gas in there, but any individual inst instantiation of PV equals NRT could actually have a hugely, nearly infinite number of actual configurations of gas molecules amount to the same thing. And it's the, it's the compact description where the power lies, the explanatory power lies. So I think we're facing the same thing in the nervous system and we need to, you know, one of the key things here are these choke points, these bottlenecks. What's the, you know, one, another way to express this is what's the easiest way to manipulate, right? If we can go in and stimulate with one electrode at one location, and make a difference in the animal's behavior. And we could also cause it to choose right rather than the left. And we could also go in with a thousand electrodes and stimulate at a thousand different locations and cause the animal to choose right or left. Well, which one of those is closer to the heart of the causal knob that you're turning? Well, it's the one you can do most parsimoniously. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, this, is a, this, this kind of stuff is a part of the science we do all the time. So I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah, I like this high-level idea, certainly for that reason of uh, having some nice explanatory power at high-level, but does any of this still get us closer to that question that we sort of opened with, which is, 
if a guy climbs into a bell tower who has a physically normal brain to all of our powers to detect yeah. pathologies we know of and shoots 14 people, is that man evil or is he a victim of his brain? Uh, yeah. Does any of this get at that, which is ultimately the free will question as, as it matters in our daily lives, right? Yeah. Uh, does any of this get us at that or, is, or are we still just kind of running around? It? It's, a, it's a great question. It's a really good question. And, and the way I would sort of frame that or the way I've thought about it and I come up against brick walls, I, I don't think about it very well, is the issue of control and control of behavior. And to what extent are, you know, the law talks all, about, all the time about someone being in control of their behavior, actions being premeditated, right, crimes being premeditated, and the law talks all the time about being out of control of behavior. And the difference between murder and manslaughter is to what extent you were in control and, or out of control when you predict the same act. So it's a deep irony that a conviction under the law of a criminal act requires, you know, what the lawyers call the, uh, the guilty, uh, uh, the guilty act and the guilty mind, okay? And I don't, I don't know how to cash out control in neurobiological terms. It seems obvious that, that normal human behavior, we have dimensions of control that certain pathological conditions don't have. I mean, a schizophrenic under frank uh, psychotic break is not capable of the kind of control that most of us are capable of. Someone with a tumor pressing on their amygdala may not be capable. Their, their degrees of freedom of choice are reduced. So I think somehow that language is gonna have to come, come in as an understanding of control mechanisms. And psychologists are kind of working on that, you know, but, I, but a lot of the problem with psychology is it just, it doesn't have deep understanding of the mechanisms of control, it just makes up words like the frontal executive. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Um, so uh, we don't understand these things yet, but you're, you're asking a very probing question, and I think that it's central to the whole concept of freedom. How, how many degrees of freedom of control do we have, and what is genetic variation among people, and to what extent does illness reduce those things, and to what extent do we have to recognize that in our legal system? I mean, it, you're going right to the heart of the matter. And I don't, I don't have a great answer. I, I just think it's really important for study in the future. We can wrap that end on that question, but we can stick around for more discussion. Okay.